I think it's important to read it the way we read other Old Testament passages. That is, that's part of genre, and we have this kind of universalistic language that occurs frequently in the Old Testament. For example, in Zephaniah 1, verse 2, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away men and beasts and birds in the sky, fish in the sea, and the idols that cause them to stumble. When I destroy all mankind from the face of the earth. But then it goes on in Zephaniah, and it's clear that he's talking about the destruction of Babylon, the destruction by Babylon on Judah. So it's clearly described in universalistic terms, but also clearly isn't universal. We get the same kind of thing in Lamentations 2, in verse uh, 22. Uh, it talks about, um, let me see, 2.22. It says, As you summon to a feast day, you summoned against me terrors on every side. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. Do you hear it? No one escaped or survived. But this is the, this is the fall of Judah. And we know that people went into exile. People did escape and survive. So we find that the biblical text uses universal language to describe huge cataclysms, disasters. So they use that language, but that doesn't mean they actually believed that it was universal in scope. We read texts like Genesis 41, 57, where it says, All the world came to Joseph for food. Mm. That sounds pretty universal. Are you going to read that literally? Well, if so, you've got to figure out how the Eskimos made it across the Atlantic <laughs> and not starve to death on the process. And all of them, not just representatives, because all the world came to Joseph for food. So we, we just have to be sensible about understanding how text works and how this language works. So we use the Bible's own rhetoric to demonstrate that universalistic language does not always pertain to a universal scope. 